Well, greetings, everybody. Good to be back again today for our Berean Bible study. Uh, tonight, we're going to be beginning with Exodus chapter 23. So if you would like to flip there, you'll be uh, right in line for where we need to be. And we will just see how far we can get. We want to talk about um, some laws that the Lord put in place here in chapter 23 and then the tabernacle plan. And we'll, we'll see what happens. So um, a lot of this is very detailed reading, detailed information. I don't propose to go through all of this in great detail. So there is certainly some work that I'll need to uh, leave for you to do. But in the meantime, let's pray and just dive right in and see what we can glean from the Word of God tonight. And Lord, again, we thank you for your goodness. Thank you for your mercy and grace toward us. Thank you for another day in your presence. Thank you, Lord God, that you fill us, you complete us, you make us what you want us to be in your image after your likeness. So Lord, I pray that you will help us today as your people to open our hearts. We pray you'll open our understanding, give us wisdom, give us the knowledge we need that we can learn what we need to learn, grow in grace and in the knowledge of you. Thank you for each one who has joined us um, tonight. And I pray that you will just speak to each heart and help all of us to glorify you together as we draw close to you and give you thanks. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. And so it's been a couple of weeks since we have been able to get together. So thank God we are uh, back together again. And we just want to dive into our a subject tonight. So we uh, spoke, of course, last week about the Ten Commandments, which was a rather big deal. That's that's one of those uh, lessons that gets us into the nitty gritty of what God was trying to communicate to Israel. But along with those Ten Commandments, there were over six hundred more commandments and laws that the Lord instituted. And so it's very important for us to go through some of these, not in minute detail, because some of those uh, really directly related to uh, Israel and their time of, of serving and obeying the Word of God in what we call the Old Testament or the First Testament. And, and then Jesus came, lived the perfect life uh, as far as fulfilling that law, and then opened to us a whole new world in what we call the New Covenant or the New Testament. And so um, we will look right now in chapter 23 at, at a, a principle that's repeated here that has come to us from minute one in Genesis. At the end of God's creation, he rested the, sev the seventh day. And now we see here in 2310, we see that this extends even to the land. Here, instead of days, he speaks of years. You shall sow your land for six years and gather in its yield. But on the seventh year, you shall let it rest and lie fallow. And then in verse 12, six days you are to do your work, but on the seventh day you shall cease from labor so that your ox and your donkey may rest, and the son of your female slave, a stranger. Uh, this Sabbath thing just extends uh, to all. And I, I uh, know I may have mentioned this in our, our last gathering, but I just want to um, make sure that we have this on board as we go forward. Three feasts were established where um, the Israelites, particularly the males, were to gather together. The women would come uh, quite often, but um, this was 
in in some cases uh, we see as as in uh, the, the the case with uh, Hannah and and you know, Samuel's mom that she also went to the feast but it specifies here in verse 15 the feast of unleavened bread uh, in verse 16 the feast of the harvest and the feast of the ingathering in those verses and then verse 17 specifies three times a year all your males shall appear before the lord god and and so they would come before the lord for these uh, feasts we will likely touch on this a little more in a little more detailed fashion when we we get to uh, the book of leviticus but uh for now i will just touch on them that these were three major times of of the nation coming together in worship to god now uh, this is interesting and important in that we see that once a week the priests would well once a day i should say the priests would operate in the tabernacle uh, get, offering sacrifices to god and people would come as necessary with sacrifices for sin for guilt for thanksgiving whatever the case may be but really this was a, a priest-led kind of worship system and three times a year now the nation particularly the males would gather and and they would have these um ceremonies so it is interesting now uh, as we look forward and get into the new covenant the new testament you see that things changed dramatically uh, where people would now come on a weekly basis and in fact in Acts chapter 2, you'd see that they would come on a daily basis. They would gather together from house to house. They would uh, gather for communion. They would, uh, th the whole worship system really evolved and changed um, from sort of a three times a year thing or come as needed to the point where on a daily basis in houses, in the temple, people would gather for worship but this is where we begin sort of the formal uh, worship covenants of uh, or, or uh, feasts and then we get into uh, chapter 24 which now starts to talk to us about um, uh, well we're, we're getting into a another little uh, episode of, of how God continued to unfold his word his will and and the participation of people in that as we get into chapter 24. Um, Moses in 24 4 he wrote down all the words of the Lord he he uh, built an altar at the foot of the mountain of course we're talking about uh, Mount Sinai here and there were 12 pillars um, that were erected for the 12 tribes of Israel. I'm not totally clear whether these were pillars separate from pillars under the altar itself, but uh, be that as it may, he, in verse 7, he took uh, the book of the covenant, what, uh, what he had recorded of what God had said. Of course, the people had heard God speak, and we talked about that last time. And the people, responded now in 24 7 that they said all that the lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient so moses now uh, took blood of the uh, bulls that he was offering as a peace offering to god and he sprinkled it on the people and he uh, sprinkled it on the uh, on the law itself and and he said, look, this is the blood of the covenant which the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Now, uh, there is a statement that was made later on that, that there is no testament that takes effect until there is the death of the 
testator. So of course, to this day, we have the concept of the last will and testament where people uh, compose their will. Here's what I want to happen when I die. And, and this is preserved for uh, to be enacted when they die. Well, God doesn't die. And, and uh, in, in this situation, in a symbolic fashion, these animals, which have always been uh, substitutes for uh, the death that humans should die because of sin, uh, these, these animals were killed. And of course, you remember all the way back to Abraham, where when God was going to establish a covenant, he had Abraham cut these animals in half and kind of line the path where the Spirit of God would go through to establish this covenant. Here again, you have these animals being killed and their blood being shed. So uh, it takes on yet another level of significance in that this was the covenant, the commandments that God had put in place. This was his will, his testament. These laws were being confirmed with blood. And uh, of course, the whole concept that takes us into the New Testament, that blood is also uh, a sign of that giving of life, and without the shedding of blood, there's no remission of sins. In other words, all sinners will die, all sinners must die, but, but uh, we, this is one of the foreshadowings of what was yet to come, where Jesus himself, the Lamb of God, would die on our behalf, and these covenants were established with blood, sins are purged with blood, life is in the blood, we receive the life of Christ through the blood he shed for us, etc., etc. Uh, so this blood was sprinkled on the people uh, in verse 8, and, and this was a sign that they were now participants in this covenant that God had given to Moses and spoken to the people. Um, now, uh, we start another interesting episode where Moses, in verse 9, 24, 9, Moses went up with Aaron, Nadab, and Abihu, and 70 of the elders of Israel. And they saw the God of Israel. And under his feet, there appeared to be a pavement of sapphire as clear as the sky itself. Yet he did not stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and they saw God, and they ate and drank. Now, this now is an incredible uh, situation where God, uh, remember Moses' father-in-law, had come along and said, you know what, you're, you're going to kill yourself. You need to get some help in, in uh, people to judge issues between one person and another. You need to get some help so that you don't kill yourself, wear yourself out. And now here are the 70, we would uh, imagine, senior elders of uh, Israel coming together with the priesthood, Aaron and his sons, Nadab and Abihu, and, and God appeared to them. Now, he had come in a particular form on the mountain. There were um, thunderings and lightnings and smoke and darkness and, and, and the voice of God. But now we come to this point where God actually revealed himself to them, and they saw the God of Israel. Uh, this is going to become very important as we go forward, and, and I, I'll sort of hold off on getting into that in detail, but I will simply make the point now that although they saw God and had this incredible experience, it didn't keep them down the road, as we will get to, from actually turning away from him and serving idols. So 
it really brings us to a point of understanding that that there is more to our relationship with God, more to our service to God than simply seeing him or having uh, incredible miracles take place that we um, participate in. It, it is very clear that there is more to it than that, and God, uh, and, and we will see that later on. Something has to happen in our hearts. We have to be changed. The heart of stone, as, as it's sometimes described, needs to be removed, and the heart of flesh needs to be inserted. We, we serve God and worship God beyond signs, wonders, miracles, visitations of God, incredible um, impartations from him, even seeing him as these people did. Um, God brought them to this incredible place where they saw him, and, and then God called Moses up into the mountain in 2412, and, and of course in 13, Joshua went up with him, his servant, and we sometimes miss that Joshua was a, such a, a big part of everything that happened with Moses. When Moses went up uh, into the mountain for 40 days, he tells us that Joshua was with him, and, and they together went up into the mountain of God. So, um, he told the elders to wait uh, for them at the base of the mountain, and that Aaron and her and these elders would take care of any legal matters that came up while the people, while Moses and Joshua were on the mountain. And so Moses went up, the cloud of God's glory covered the mountain, rested on Mount Sinai in verse 16. And for six days, God just had them wait. And then on the seventh day, he called to Moses and their conversation began. Um, the eyes of the sons of Israel, verse 17, um, saw the appearance of the glory of God and was like a consuming fire on the mountaintop. And Moses entered the midst of the cloud as he went up to the mountain, and he was there 40 days and 40 nights. Okay, so that's chapters 23 and 24. And so let me um, take a, a break here for a moment. And if there's anything that you want to talk about in these chapters, obviously, as I usually mention in our sessions, we are um, moving at a pretty good clip because this is not a detailed book study. It's a, a survey. So I'm just touching on some of the key points as we go along. But if there's something in particular that you would like to um, talk about, please. Uh, now is your opportunity. Sister Deanne, go ahead, please. So in Exodus um, 24, 10, yep. it talked about how the elders saw God, right? Mm -hmm. yep. And so um, previously, it was mentioned that no one can see my face and remain alive. Yeah. How do we, how do we deal with this seemingly contradictory episode? Yeah. So it, in verse eleven, it, it says he didn't stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel, and then it repeated, and they saw God, and they ate and drank. They didn't die. They actually had a uh, a feast. So so. There are there are times. One that comes to mind right now is the whole law of how you would deal with lepers. You couldn't touch them. You they had to be outside of the town, crying unclean. Yet there was a leper that came to Jesus and said, "If you will, you can make me clean." And Jesus touched him and said, "I will be clean." And so. We have the law, but God certainly reserves the right for his own purposes to suspend or, um, you know, just 
yeah, suspend the the consequences of of whatever may happen at his will. I hear you. I'm I'm still <laughs> grappling. <laughs> it's just like okay, all right. I I'm gonna go back to the. God is God and God could do whatever he wants to do. And, you know, this thing, this, this, this book isn't black and white at times. It's not an either or. Uh, no, no. Uh, it's like um, uh, Samson's parents, right? His mom saw this angel that told her husband about it. And she's, wait a minute, I've seen the angel of the Lord. I should be dead. And her husband said, hey, if he wanted to kill you, you would have been dead. Um, there's something going on. God is, um, you know, going outside of uh, the the box, but but he he can do that if he so chooses. And he, uh, her husband said, okay, um, if the angel comes again, then let me know. And so we have this angel of the Lord concept, which is what we also call a theophany, God appearing in human form. We have um, uh, the, the three uh, who came, the angels, and the representation of, of God himself coming to Abraham uh, to talk about the birth of Isaac. Uh, then the two angels went on to Sodom, and, and God, it would seem, stayed back to meet with Abraham. And yeah, there are, there are situations like this even as we will read before too long, where Moses the second time, you know, went up the mountain when he came down after being in the presence of God for 40 days, um, his face was glowing. And the scripture says he spoke to God face to face. And it's like, okay. So there, there are some situations where we read and you know, we'll uh, come up against this as we go forward, where there are some people that God has dealt with in a very unique and special way for his own purposes. And we just leave it at that. Uh, Pastor Adrian. Thanks, Pastor. Just to um, add a little twist to that, I'm, I'd like to just raise a couple of observations. Um, so when, when in Exodus 33, we, we we're going to see that Moses... Um, uh, saw God. Um, mm -hmm. Indeed, it says, uh, uh, you know, that that Moses sp spoke to him face to face. Mm -hmm. um, but then it also says when Moses uh, asks him if I can, uh, he says, "Lord, show me your face." And 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 God says, "You cannot see my face, for no one can see my face and live." And then towards the end of that chapter, it talks about how God is going to. And we make a song about it. God is going to. Um, Put him in the cleft of a rock and cover him with his hand until he passed. Yeah. Uh, and he can see his back, but he says, but my face must not be seen. And mm -hmm. in in uh, Exodus 24, it's interesting that in uh, verse 10, um, after saying that, uh, you know, the elders saw the God of Israel, it mm -hmm. says it describes what was under his feet. Yeah. Um, but but it's interesting. It doesn't it doesn't describe anything to do with his face. So mm -hmm. um, if, I think if you see where I'm going there, is there any significance there that that can be drawn uh, about whether they saw a particular part of God like Moses from the cleft of the rock? Any any comments on that? Uh, no, uh, simply uh, <laughs> uh, this the scripture doesn't give us more. Uh, clarity than this from the standpoint that uh, where it, it mentions they saw God, uh, it, it's the, the kind of thing where, where you say, okay, does the plain sense uh, of this make sense? Does it seem to be language that is symbolic in some way, hyperbolic in some way, um, uh, mysterious? In, in, they, they saw God. And then it talks about what God was walking on. Um, so I, I, I personally have not taken it beyond that, just um, as it was when they heard his voice 
and and Moses, as we touched on last time, uh, just kept harping on this. God actually spoke, and they heard the voice of God speaking. I, I just take it as uh, at at face value. It's not a psalm talking about something in a very uh, uh, allegorical fashion. So, uh, and and even that little insertion that he didn't stretch out his hand against the nobles of the sons of Israel. I, I, again, harkens back to that thing that no one can see God and live, yet they saw God and lived. But I wouldn't want to go out on a, you know, any further than just these few words to say, seeing God in, in the context of what we're reading here, seems to have been a really incredible experience that should have resulted in their death, but did not. Um, and, and Manoah had the same thing um, with uh, he and his wife with the, the birth before the birth of Samson and um, Moses, yes, in 33, he was protected and God again repeated what they knew they couldn't see God and live. Earlier, uh, he had said, don't come near the mountain, don't touch it, you know, there, or, or else you'll die. So it's, it's just um, interesting, but I, I don't want to uh, try to dive in more than what is here and to say that God does reserve the right um, to do as he pleases. And when we get to the life of Christ, we will see that he often not only does very unexpected things that weren't supposed to be done in that society, he, he goes beyond that and, and explains what the word really means, what God's intent was behind some of the things we uh, read in the Old Testament. Um, here they saw God and lived, whatever that may, you know, we may take that to mean in its, in its reality. And then later on, someone touched the ark, and they were struck dead. So um, there seems to be something that goes beyond just the straight words into intent. And um, God chose to show himself and reveal himself in this way. In the case of the ark, and um, Uzzah touching the ark, well, the people were in disobedience. There was a procedure, a way that the ark should be moved, and they totally disregarded that and, and took it upon themselves to even touch it, which was totally forbidden, and judgment was swift. So I, I think I'll just leave it at that and we sort of take God as he reveals himself and does what he does for whatever purposes he may have in mind. Okay, anyone else with something on chapters 23 and 24? Sister Janet. Yes, um, Pastor, I was just wondering, isn't it only because because um, God knows the person's heart. Um, for example, they touched the, the ark. I would think that God knows that person's heart. And that's why there's a chastisement upon that individual. Mm -hmm. What do you think about that? Yeah, no, I, I agree with that. There are times um, Moses uh, is another example for all that he did and all the experiences he had, one day God, uh, there are times that God told him, hey, the people need water, take your rod and strike the rock and water will come out. Well, another day God said to him, speak to the rock. Well, Moses took his rod as he had at other times and struck the rock, water came out and Moses was denied entrance into the promised land because he had acted in, in 
total disobedience, in anger, in rage. God said, no, this is kind of the to whom much is given, much uh, shall be required kind of thing. Um, so I do think there's a lot to be said for the condition of one's heart and God's response uh, to them, to their actions, based upon what's actually happening in their heart. So I, I think uh, that is something we, we do consider. Sister uh, Deanne. So I'm wondering, because I, I think maybe it's my, my Western mindset and, you know, just trying to pinpoint or figure God out, right? Mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. in those, if then, if, th if you do this, then that, if you do. And yeah. so if, if I were to step back from that, right, mm -hmm. even if I were to step back from that idea of, you know, trying to uh, associate uh, cause um, and effect with what's mm -hmm. happening, it, when I when I hear what Sister Janet just said, um, mm -hmm. I I I have a little bit of trouble saying you know yes yes I agree to that because again if we we were to look at what happened to 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 Job, you know we know that there wasn't anything going on with his heart right and so it's just like mm -hmm. I, I guess there are no hard and fast no I can't even say that there are no hard and fast rules because we know that in some cases <laughs> there are. So I'm in a place of, you know, dissonance at this point, because yeah. uh, 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 there are some things that we can say, yes, for sure, if we do this, then this will happen. But there seems to be so many other things where we just can't pinpoint God. And then, and so then I'm like, okay, so how then do I really get to know God? You know, I'm not, I'm not sure. Yeah, so we have the whole concept of laws and commandments and uh, God lays out these laws and they're to be followed. And then situations come up. Um, where would this be? I think it's in Leviticus. Uh, of course, the, the inheritance, the land passes down from father to sons and girls really uh, didn't get anything, what would happen is the girls would marry within their tribe and, and the, you know, they would uh, be the mothers and that was kind of their, their role in life. Well, there was a man who only had daughters. And so, so they came to Moses to say, well, what's going to happen? Our father um, is dead. Uh, we are his offspring, so why should we not be able to participate in the inheritance? And so Moses went to God, and God said, yep, they're right. Um, here's what they, they should do. They need to marry uh, men within their tribe so the land doesn't leave the tribe. Uh, it will stay in the tribe, but then it would continue to pass. Now, th those uh, sons-in-law coming into the family would become as sons and the land would then pass through them to the children of those unions. So there are, there are times when you see God acting in ways we, we can't quite figure out. So what do we do? Number one, we obey the laws we have before us. Number two, if there is some circumstance that comes up that seems to uh, say that this law needs to be um, amended, reinterpreted, whatever, there are elders that God put in place. That's what the priests and the elders would do on behalf of um, Israel, and they would make judgments based on the law. And of course, as we uh, spoke about last time, something like the Ten Commandments, they weren't meant to be read in, in light of the enlightenment or scientific method and all of that, the, the, um, the other uh, terms that we, you know, the scholastic method and all of that. Uh, God is dealing with relationship, not just laws and commandments. And so, so that's much more the basis of our understanding of his law 
It's based on him wanting us to have a good relationship more so than us adhering to the letter of whatever <clears throat> law. So if, you know, if we, we look at things, and even in Bible times they had it. Pastor Adrian was speaking about this a few weeks ago. <clears throat> Man goes out, hire servants, um, I'll pay you a denarius. They work the day, they get a denarius. The man goes out at the last hour of the day, hires people, pays them a denarius. And the people are going, um, that doesn't seem right to us. And the man's answer was, well, number one, I'm not violating my contract with you. I said, I'd give you a denarius. I did. And now there are others who I want to be kind to. Can I not be kind with my own money? So, so we have the human response to God's laws and God's actions. And then there is God's response where he's saying, I really can do what I want to do for whatever my purposes are. And in the case of that parable, he said, I want to be kind. I haven't violated my contract with you in any way. You are looking through human lens, uh, a human lens at what you believe is fair and equitable. I'm looking at these people uh, from the lens of uh, compassion and care, and I want to be kind. So, so we, uh, if we are trying to figure God out, we do have to figure him out through the lens of um, certainly where we are, the lens of Jesus Christ, um, who, who did not seek to condemn he did not seek to uphold every law to the detriment of the individuals he was dealing with. He was willing and demonstrated in his own life an overriding, overarching desire to bless and to save and to um, do things that we certainly would not think are warranted, right, um, or certainly in any way expected so it's uh, and, and life is complex that's a term we use uh, nowadays people ask about relationships and they go well it's complicated that's uh, kind of a modern way of saying things don't always go as expected and we're just trying to deal with uh, things as they appear god does not always act in the ways that we think he should act or even in ways that he may have told us he's going to act because he has a very complicated personality and he can choose to do things which always seem to turn out for the benefit of individuals um, but at the same time uh, he can judge and he can he can do things that we don't expect based on our hearts, our disobedience, our obedience, our rebellion, our submission, whatever the case may be, God can act in whatever way he chooses to respond to our inputs. Uh, Sister Elise. So I'm wondering maybe a slightly different angle that um, there are... Th th God put in place, for example, that you could not go and look at the ark. And if anybody went and looked at the ark, they would die. Yeah. And, um, and, and yet uh, the priest could go in and stand before the ark and would not die unless they had violated the laws of God and hadn't taken care of it. So, mm -hmm. and I feel like in this situation, God was the one who initiated this, yeah. this visit. Um, if, if I, and if one of the people who was not invited had come and come up to the altar, come up to the mountain without invitation, mm -hmm. I feel like they probably would have died. But yeah, if, so. if God, God's, orchestrated this and said you guys come up here so they were going in obedience 
to the command of God. And mm -hmm. so in that sense, like even when Moses asked, he, you know, it was a request and God kind of granted it, but protected him at the same time. But in this case, it's God said, you come up here, you stay here, you do this. And they followed his instructions, it sounds like, to the T. Yeah. And he did it and he honored that. Yeah, I, I totally accept all, all that you have said. And that's just part of God's complexity. Uh, Brother James? So I know in the New Testament, we talk a lot about faith, but what I'm hearing in this discussion kind of sounds like Old Testament really did rely on faith. So, so even though things that happen that things that happen to people maybe didn't seem fair, you have faith that you're doing your best and God will honor what you're doing. So it sounds like to me, it just comes back to faith in God even though he said one thing and then later on something else happened. Uh, of course, the whole uh, concept of the just shall live by faith is an Old Testament concept. Uh, we read it in the New Testament and we kind of think of it in those terms, but it's Old Testament. Love your neighbor as yourself, it's Old Testament. Uh, so, there are a lot of things that we think of as New Testament concepts that are really Old Testament concepts, faith being one of them. Um, but but I, I, I think in, in the end, all, we, all I'm trying to, to say here is that uh, we do what we know is right. That's our job. Um, to the best of our understanding, to the best of our learning, we try to obey the laws and commandments of God. Um, he will deal with us according to his knowledge of us, our desires toward him, our reaching out after him, our seeking his face, etc. And if he chooses to suspend one of his laws in our favor, whatever the case may be, that's up to him. But that doesn't mean that if he does that for you, then I can presume to do something that I know I should not do that violates the word of God. Uh, saying, well, if God made an exception for James, he'll make an exception for me. I can't uh, live in that realm. So we read the word, we interpret it to the best of our ability, and certainly we have others to help us, even as Ezra did with the, the, the folks from like 9 a.m. till 12 noon, he, he read the law and gave them the sense, gave them the understanding of what it was really trying to say and, and uh, trying to make it clear. So we do that for ourselves. We get help in doing that and we obey and leave the rest in God's hands. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Is it is it fair to say then that even though there are commandments that need to be followed, it really comes down to our God can treat us differently. So, so even though we have like the set of commandments to follow, it really comes down to God treating us or or interacting with us as he sees, sees fit and doesn't necessarily mean he's going to interact with somebody else the exact same way. No, that, that's exactly correct. And, and um, we, we just need to be comfortable with that, that we do have uh, individual relationships with God. Uh, before our own master, we stand or fall. And we don't go about judging others for what they do and certainly not judging God for what he chooses to do or not to do in a particular situation. That's, that's totally beyond our uh, capability or, or should be uh, something we don't engage in. We do what we know is right and we obey to the best of our ability. We try even like uh, a guy like David, who made horrible, 
mistakes, who sinned horribly, including the, the biggest two, uh, murder and adultery, um, greatest sin against uh, another and sin against yourself. Well, he was still described as a man after God's own heart because underneath all of that sin and badness, he at the core had a heart after God. Uh, Jacob was the same thing. So there, there are examples we'll see of people who aren't the greatest. They don't do the best, but because of their heart desire toward God and their desire to have relationship with him, God does amazing things on their behalf. Now, Sister Elise, I see your hand is still up. I don't know if that was because you had another question or because you just forgotten to take it down. No, I just haven't found it yet. The take down <laughs> sign yet. Okay. Okay. So uh, I just want to make sure I start talking about the next um, number of chapters. And to be frank, I'm going to have to let you read a lot of this on your own. It's basically from uh, chapter 25 to chapter 32. So for your reading assignment, before you read ahead to what will come next week, we do need to uh, address Exodus 25 to 32, and I will touch on some of these things as we go through because I, I want to make sure that we cover off on this before we finish today. And when I say cover off on it, it's just to mention a couple of the key points, and, and we will, um, I'll leave it to you to do a lot of the reading from that point on. Chapter 25 starts us on uh, a number of chapters, as I mentioned, to the end of 32, that talk about God's desire, um, which is expressed in verse 8, 25, 8, let them construct a sanctuary for me that I may dwell among them. And so here we have God making a statement that, guess what, folks, I want to dwell among you. That's phenomenal. That really is phenomenal. God is saying, I want to dwell among my people. And so, construct a sanctuary for me. Now, these were uh, people on the move, living in tents in the wilderness. And so, God said, okay, I want to be right in the middle of you. So, build me a tent and, and give me a place where I can be among you, a sanctuary for me. And I, I think that is um, really quite striking. So uh, the previous verses just had Moses, uh, the Lord saying to Moses, speak to the people, let them bring to me what they want to bring to offer for the sanctuary that needs to be built. So then he starts giving Moses instructions on how to make and what to make to put into this tabernacle. So uh, the, the first thing that he gets to is in 2510, the Ark of the Covenant. Um, and he describes um, how it, it should be built and the dimensions of it. Now it's two and a half cubits long, a cubit being about 18 inches. So um, you're, you're looking at uh, for for rough numbers, uh, like a four and a half by two foot box. And I, I am still kind of stuck in the imperial system. I don't have all my millimeters and centimeters worked out. But for um, those of you who are um, much more versed in the metric system, you can probably break that down uh, or do what I do, get a conversion app on my phone <laughs> that I can go back and forth 
as needed. But this was not a big box, let's say about four, four and a half feet by about two feet. So it, it wasn't huge or two and a half feet. And, and this box now was to be built as a, a, a very precious and symbolic box representing the spirit of God as, as we sort of get a little understanding of as we go through this reading. So it wasn't to be touched. They were to make rings on the four corners of the ark. Poles would be um, inserted through these rings and the Levites would carry the ark when it needed to move. And, and that's, that's what they, they should do. Now, um, on top of the, the, in the ark in 2516, you shall put into the ark the testimony which I shall give you. So God had called Moses up to the mountain. He said, I'm going to give you the Ten Commandments on these tablets of stone. Put them into the ark. And uh, 17, you shall make a mercy seat of pure gold, uh, two and a half cubits long, one and a half cubits wide. So on top of the, of the uh, ark would be this uh, thing now, uh, and, and many of you have run across this as you, if you do a Google search of the tabernacle, you'll see representations of what, what these items look like. And, and so the significance of this continues. Uh, let me go down to verse 21. You shall put the mercy seat, seat on top of the ark, and in the ark you shall put the testimony which I will give to you. We read that also in verse 16. There I will meet with you, and from above the mercy seat, and from between the two cherubim, which are upon the ark of the testimony, I will speak to you about all that I will give you in commandment for the sons of Israel. So there is this particular area above the mercy seat and between uh, the wings of the cherubim that God said, from there, I will speak to you. Um, and and so, so this now becomes the symbol of the presence of God, the place from which God speaks. The, the box that contained the uh, symbol of the law and the commandments. He just did the tablets with the ten, but they represent... <clears throat> Uh, all the other laws that God spoke to Moses. And it also represents the mercy of God. He said, I have a seat on top of the ark. You know, inside the ark are all the laws and judgment uh, and, and rules and commandments for you to follow. But guess what? I know all about you. I know that you won't and can't keep that. So, you will be able to come to the mercy seat. And I am there speaking from the seat of mercy. You might call it the throne of mercy, that he, I am the judge sitting, you know, the foundation of my judgment is my word, my commandments, but I will speak to you from this mercy seat. And so, uh, this is a very significant thing for us as we think of the presence of God and what to expect when we are in the presence of God. Now, I understand we're speaking very specifically about the ark and Israel, but the principle is that uh, we are dealing with a God of mercy and a God of justice and judgment at the same time, but God speaks to us from the seat of mercy. 
um, chapter 25 continues to talk about the bread of the presence or the bread of the face in verse 30. Um, tells them how to make a table for what they called show bread and and bread would be placed there every day and and this would be part of the priest's food but but the bread of the presence uh, a number of folks you may you may have run across this reading your commentaries uh, will speak of this as the word of god certainly um the word of God is referred to as, as bread and uh, that we need to eat. And this bread is called the bread of the presence or the bread of the face. To extrapolate, we see God in his word. We meet God in his word. We get to know him and to know how we should live. And this show bread was to be on it um, at all times and and in a similar fashion the word of god needs to be coming into us they would eat the bread the priest would and and this would strengthen and sustain them and we do want to remember that about the word of god for our spiritual well-being we need to continually consume the word of god uh, let me, um, and and from there, uh, we have also in this place, and I'm, I'm just sort of touching on them as they appear in Scripture, not necessarily, it, it's like actually you're coming from the inner chamber back out to the outer chamber. First thing is God and his word and his mercy and his kindness and compassion there into the next section of the tabernacle you'll you'll read as you um the the bread of the presence of god the face of god and on the other side of the the room the golden candlestick and here it describes how the containers the bulbs the snuffers the trays all this would be made and and that starts at verse 31 and takes us to the end of the the chapter and saying listen they um uh don't make any other lamps like it this is a very specific pattern moses i'm giving to you and this is for the golden lampstand, which again, um, our choir used to sing a song years ago, Jesus is the light of the world. And, and again, of course, he said that himself, I am the light of the world. And, and so the bread of the presence represents the word of God. And certainly this golden lampstand represents the presence of God, Jesus being the light of the world, God with us. And, and of course, the ark is the, the representation of God himself um, and a representation of what he has come to do. He has given us a way to live and he will judge us from his judgment seat on the way we live, but it is also a place we go to obtain the mercy and grace, compassion, and kindness of our loving Father. So here in this chapter, we have the Ark of the Covenant. We have the mercy seat, of course, on top of it. We have the table of showbread and the golden lampstand. Uh, any quick thought, any quick uh, question or comment on chapter 25? Okay, chapter 26 now gives us a lot of instructions about the outer uh, perimeter of the tabernacle, how, the, how it should be constructed. Basically, it, it went all the way around uh, what comes inside um, with one entrance in, 
for the priest to go in to perform their duties. Now, uh, along with those curtains on the outside, 2631 talks about another curtain that was on the inside, a veil of blue and purple and scarlet and fine twisted linen. Um, and it shall be made with cherubim, the work of a skilled workman. So now he starts to describe this veil, this curtain that would separate the Ark of the Covenant from what they, it's called the outer court, uh, where the showbread and the lampstand, and of course there's an altar of incense we will get to shortly. But uh, here um, he's just saying, put this curtain, that will be a separation between um, the holy place and as verse 33 uh, talks about the holy place and the holy of holies, the direct presence, the symbolic direct presence of God. And, and so we please read through that, um, the, the, the veil, the table sitting outside the veil and the lampstand opposite um, on the table on one side and uh, another table on the, the north side with the showbread and, and a screen uh, to enter into the holy place. And of course, a big screen curtain to enter into the holy of holies. So he describes all of that here. Then chapter 27 uh, starts to talk to us about the altar uh, where the sacrifices would be made. And so now uh, you are coming into the tabernacle. The first thing you see is this altar and describes how that uh, should be made. Um, so, so this these chapters up to 27 uh, describe the construction of the tabernacle a place where god could be with his people and dwell among them in his sanctuary so let me just pause there uh, for another moment at the end of chapter 27 everybody good okay number 28 uh pastor adrian yes pastor i've been uh, following as you've been talking through it um and i, I may have missed it uh, did you talk about aaron's rod that budded and the bowl of manna um no uh in... I, I think it's it, it's not touched specifically in here but i just wanted yeah, to exactly just... yeah yeah so so i um there, there is, uh, as we get later on, we will see that there is quite a uh, discussion. I, I don't think it's something that, again, we would need to go crazy over. Um, what was in the ark? Was it just the, um, the tablets of stone with the commandments? Was it also a bowl with manna? And what about Aaron's rod? So as we go along um, uh, into the book of, uh, well, yeah, I, I'll, I'll leave that when we start touching on some of these things going through the book of Numbers. And, and so we'll, we'll see there why there is some debate and controversy about that. What, what this initial... Uh, communication from God tells us uh, is about the the testimony, the law that was placed inside the box. Okay, now chapter twenty eight goes into quite a description of uh, and and chapter twenty eight uh, chapter. 29 uh, speak about the priests, their garments, 
and their ordination. And so, uh, again, a lot of detailed reading, but here is here are a couple of highlights. Um, 28.2, you are to make holy garments for Aaron, your brother, for glory and for beauty. So there was this enrobing of the priests, and it wasn't just in this case a matter of, of um, uh, just wear something like Adam and Eve, skins to cover your body. Here, these garments were being made to be glorious and to be beautiful. Well, uh, why? Because these priests actually were acting as representatives of God. And, and so God is glorious and God is beautiful. And the garments of the priest reflected that. So uh, I know there are some religious organizations where their priests are very, um, you know, they have some pretty spectacular uh, robes, costumes, whatever term you would want to use. And before we just decry that, uh, there is a place for the servants of God to reflect the glory and the beauty of God. Now, but when we come into the New Testament, we will see how that really takes on a different aspect. It's not just the physical, it's the spiritual. And so we, we will get to that when we get into the New Testament. Here we are, uh, Aaron and his sons being dressed in very ornate robes that reflected the glory and beauty of God. They would be anointed, they would be consecrated uh, in verse 3. And, and verse 4 says, here are the garments you will make, a breast piece, an ephod, and a robe, and a tunic of checkered work, a turban, and a sash. And uh, these are all the things that would be made. And then there are details of how all of that um, should be done as you continue reading on through the the chapter and again very very detailed like the breastplate that had um these precious stones and rows across it representing the tribes of israel and um in in verse 29 28 and 29 aaron shall carry the names of the sons of israel in the breastplate of judgment over his heart when he enters the holy place for a memorial before the Lord continually. So he is dressed uh, for glory and for beauty, certainly uh, representing the glory and beauty of God and you know, the glory and privilege and majesty that accrued to Aaron and his sons as representatives of God on earth. And over his heart. And again, you start to think symbolically of how this would relate to God. In his heart, uh, Israel was there. These stones represented the tribes of Israel, and, and this was real close to God's heart. And then it talks about, further on down, uh, the construction of the robe, the tunic, the turban, the sash, and and these things were to be on as they went to be consecrated um, and ordained into the service of God. And verse 42 uh, just mentions something that is often uh, referred to as sort of a, a basic st <clears throat> a standard of dress as far as what um, should be covered, these linen breeches from the loins even to the thighs. And so um, uh, this, particularly for a man, uh, covers, uh, is, is God's uh, instruction here of these people going to minister before me need to be covered. It starts with their basic undergarments that were kind of 
like the length of basketball shorts covering their uh, midsection, uh, going down and covering their, their thighs. And then uh, over that, they had their, their um, tunic, their ephod, their turban, their sash, all of these things. But, but they were to be very modest in this context, meaning that they were not to have their body uncovered and on display uh, for the public to see. But in fact, they had some very ornate robes made um, uh, that speak about God's care of Israel and the fact that they are on his heart at all times. Um, that's chapter 28. Any quick word or thought there? And again, it's very detailed reading, so I, I will leave that for you. Okay. Um, chapter 29 speaks about the consecration of the priests and, and how the animals would be killed, uh, what would be done, where blood of the animals would be placed on the priest as part of his consecration and ordination to God. Uh, again, life being given, blood being shed, this priesthood, this call to the uh, priesthood was, was incredibly important and they entered into this um, covenantal relationship as being partners with God to represent God to the people. And so that's uh, that's chapter uh, 29 up to verse 30 and then it talks about the food of the priests and uh, what what, they would uh, get as the ram of their ordination was offered and they would eat the flesh of that. Leviticus talks to us much more about portions of sacrifices that would come in and how the priests would be fed by that and how they would uh, eat the bread, the show bread. And, and so these offerings from the people were part of the sustenance of the, the priests. Um, Brother Dean. You're you're still muted. Go ahead, Brother Dean. You are muted. If you're speaking, we're not hearing you. Your mic is muted. Okay. So, I'm sorry. I'm having trouble okay. with the uh, with the phone, Pastor. Forgive me. Uh, it's it's changing all the time. I don't know why that is, but every time I seem to be on the phone, it seems to be slightly different. Um, with all these things that are going on for Israel, am I am I wrong because of my Western views that I don't necessarily um, what's the word? I see this uh, testament, the Old Testament, as coming through the people of Israel. And I, I went like myself to the Western view that uh, a lot of these things, and I'm getting to the part at the end of 29 that you're coming up upon. Then I will live amongst the people of Israel and be their God, and they will know that I am the Lord, their God. Now, we're very happy as Christians to acknowledge that we have the God of Israel, Isaac and Jacob. But I don't know that everything that they're going through here is relative to me. As a Christian, and, and I know that you're going to say, well, it's the Old Testament, but um, I think there's a lot of uh, revelation um, from, uh, from the New Testament that looks back at this and say, well, you know, I don't know that it's important or not, whether or not God said, um, like you said about going up the mountain, there was times you could go up the mountain and there's times you couldn't go up the mountain and so on and so forth. Uh, mm -hmm. It's just more important to be in God's will, is it not? Yeah, so what we are reading here is very specific to Israel, very specific to the priesthood, very specific to the tabernacle. He gave specific to Israel as being uh, the nation through whom God chose to reveal himself to the world, specific to his covenant with Abraham, that in his seed, 
all the families of the earth would be blessed. And then, of course, reading that, um, uh, as I think we did a few weeks ago, to say that seed is Christ. So it's all yes. of this is leading up to Christ. And then when we get there, we will see that he really is the fulfillment of the law. He lived in perfect obedience to the law. He did everything that should be done on our behalf. Then he died a, a, a horrible death in our place. So it's a matter that God gave the law. Nobody could obey the law. Jesus came on our behalf, obeyed the law perfectly, therefore was not under the penalty of death, but chose death as a substitute for us. And so, so that's where a lot of stuff drops off uh, because Jesus has taken care of it, um, nailed all our sins to his cross, died to establish a new covenant. Then we get into understanding, okay, what's this new covenant about? How is it that we live now compared to how they lived then? And, and so that's why I'm not going through these chapters with a fine tooth comb. It's, it's good to read. And some of you have been through a read the Bible in a year plan. Uh, part of it is just that we actually get this on board and understand uh, how important this was to God, how many chapters he devoted to this. There were, what, one and a half chapters he used to describe how he made the heavens and the earth. Uh, that didn't seem to be super duper important to him. This is. And he has spent chapters of laying this out for us to understand that this is how God was in the presence of Israel and how important it was for them to maintain that uh, relationship. And as you mentioned, it is very key that we just look at these verses at the end of chapter 29, verses 45 and 46. Um, I, well, actually, I will start at 44. He, he says, I will consecrate the tent of meeting and the altar. God is going to consecrate that. That is going to be set apart to him. The priests were set apart to him. The altar as a place of sacrifice and, of course, sacrifices brought there set apart to him. I will also consecrate Aaron and his sons to minister as priests to me. So, yes, there were priests of God, but um, uh, they're uh, priests representing the people, but they're described here as priests of God and uh, ministering to him. Um, ministering as priest to God in verse 44 and 45, I will dwell among the sons of Israel and will be their God. So again, all of this is bringing us to this climax that God is saying, I will be their God. They shall know that I am the Lord, their God, verse 46, who brought them out of the land of Egypt that I might dwell among them. I am the Lord, their God. So again, um, God has delivered them with a strong hand. They have been delivered from death by the Passover. They have feasts now that have been instituted for them. God has been, uh, has instituted feeding them every day and giving them water to drink. God has now given them his commandments, how they should live, and and now he has said, I want a tent also right in the middle of you. So we'll be together because I am the Lord, your God. So that brings us to the end of chapter uh, 29. But let me do uh, 30 also before we stop. I see our time is, is short. Now it mentions the altar of incense that had not been mentioned before so in chapter 30 it talks about this altar of incense 
uh, cubit, uh, about um, fingertip to elbow, a cubit, uh, length shall be a cubit, the width a cubit, so about 18 inches square. It shall, uh, and the height would be two cubits. Its horns shall be of one piece with it. And again, goes on about the gold and the poles and, and how to transport it. And uh, then it, it talks about God's plan for uh, tithing and, and giving as far as Israel was concerned. Um, verse 11, this is 30, 11. Uh, uh, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, when you take a, a census of the sons of Israel, to number them, each of them shall give a ransom for himself to the Lord. Remember, we were reading about um, uh, rede the, the, the firstborn belonging to God and redeeming the life of the firstborn by money in the case of a human being. It certainly is an offering in the case of animals. And uh, so this money that now those who are already alive and well before this law came into effect were to bring money to atone for themselves money to devote themselves to god and this was brought in in verse 16 uh, you shall give it for the service of the tent of meeting so there were costs involved in maintenance, upkeep, uh, bread, you know, sacrifices. And, and so this redemption money, which again kept people from being uh, sacrificed and given to God, this money was given instead to the priests for the maintenance of the tent of meeting, this tabernacle in the wilderness. Then it also talks about in verse 18, this labor of bronze. So uh, this basin, big basin of water that the priests would wash in or wash with before entering into um, giving sacrifices and certainly entering into the, uh, holy of, the holy place or the holy of holies. Then he describes from 22 to 33 the oil of anointing that would be used for those who are in the service of God. And, uh, and, and so specific instructions, again, that would be used uh, to make this, this anointing oil, and which then should be used only for the priests and not for any lay person who just said, oh yeah, no problem, I'll anoint myself. This, this was another step, another part of consecrating and dedicating and ordaining these priests to God. And, and that takes us to the end of chapter 30. And um, actually, I made a mistake earlier. I just wanted to get, get to the end of chapter 31 tonight, not the end of 32. We'll pick up on 32 uh, next time. But uh, again, now in, in chapter 31, we have one more little thing I want to throw into the mix for tonight, that here in the Old Testament, we have the, the first example well, I shouldn't say that uh, Joseph was the first example, but here is, is a shining example of how God would work through people in the Old Testament. So chapter 31, 1, the Lord spoke to Moses saying, See, I have called by name Bezalel, the son of Uri, the son of Hur, of the tribe of Judah. I have filled him with the Spirit of God in wisdom in understanding, in knowledge, and in all kinds of craftsmanship. And goes on to, to uh, talk about this, that 
this man was set apart by God for himself to do this work. And God filled him with his spirit for, uh, to give him the power and ability to do the work that uh, needed to be done. And so it's critical. We see this spirit um, of God being given to Saul to lead the people, uh, to David to lead the people, to, God, to the priest uh, or to Bezalel to, for the construction of so many things in the tabernacle. And, and of course, the whole ordination ceremony for the priests, including the anointing oil, of course, is referred to in the New Testament, the Holy Spirit being referred to as that oil, symbolized by oil. So the Spirit of God was working in people in the Old Testament, empowering them to do amazing things. The Spirit of God is in His people in the 21st century, empowering us to do great things for God. And we should not think that we can or should act in our own ability, in our own power, but in the power of the Holy Spirit as God works in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. So again, please read through those chapters um, as you have an opportunity in detail and, and that'll give you everything you need to know about the construction of the tabernacle so that God could dwell with his people. So that's all I'm going to say for tonight. If there are some questions that anyone may have or a last comment you'd like to make, this is your last opportunity for tonight. Thank you, Pastor. Well, you're most welcome. And so, Brother James, I think I'll ask you if you'd be so kind to end our recording. And uh, folks, we will, uh, Pastor Adrian, go ahead, please. No, I just thought I'd put in something for us to think about there, Pastor. Uh, in the chapter 30, um, uh, atonement money, uh -huh. uh, when, when conducting the census. Uh-huh. Is there any reference link to um, David's counting of Israel and then uh, the plague coming upon them? Uh, actually, yeah. Um, <laughs> uh, you're thinking upon all these anomalies. Uh, we, when, we, uh, we, when we get into the life of, of David, it's, it's not that... Um, there was never a census done. And clearly, uh, when we get to the book of Numbers, that is one of the things that I'll highlight there. For sure, they counted. For sure, they were supposed to count and, and have this information. But again, it comes down to the heart of why David was doing what he was doing. Uh, it seems, again, that, that pride rose up in his heart. Well, we will uh, get to that. Uh, section. Um, it's not that Israel should never be numbered, but it was that Israel should not be numbered. Uh, certainly in the case of, of David and Joab was trying hard to get that through to him. Um, we trust in God. Uh, God is not restricted to save by many or by few. Jonathan knew that. And as we see him and his armor bearer, doing mighty things for God just because of faith. So so if we if the people were being numbered to make David feel good that he had all that he needed to defeat the enemy, well, some of you will remember the story of Gideon, where God said, nope, you cannot have that attitude. And so I'm going to whittle down your number to the point where it's impossible for you to do anything and uh, you cannot win this battle without me. And so then God went ahead and won the battle for them. And, and they were not in a place to take credit for themselves. So that it seems to have been David's motivation 
um, self-serving and prideful, not faith-filled, trusting in God. Uh, so there are a lot of things, uh, folks, we look at. Everything is not cut and dried. Everything is not always um, just simple, low-hanging fruit. But a lot is. Probably, well, I'd say the majority is. But we certainly have seen that God is a complex individual. And he does things we don't always understand and we need to be good with that and let god be god hallelujah thank you jesus see you next week